Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Press Pay Lifestyle Inspired Podcast, where we do interviews with really interesting people like Miss Monica here. And we work on topics that we hope will help our listeners, that's you, find the resources, tools, and support that they need to be their best inspired selves. So how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am good, other than I'm freezing my tuchus off because I live in Wisconsin and I someday will choose not to. I doubt that, but... It's cold, super cold. You will. I I survived the Midwest as well. I'm from Chicago originally, so uh, I moved to California about gosh, 14 years ago, maybe longer. Uh, so you can you can make it out can this it. way. I promise. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> moved a lot as a kid. So we lived in te- um, Tennessee and Arizona and um, Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a meaty gal, and it doesn't help. It's, it's still cold. It, it's still cold. <laughs> it's still cold. I ne- never got used to it, so I hear you on that, but it's cold in California, but I won't tell you what, uh, what the weather is like, because that would you just know, be mean, so. <laughs> well, someone told me, though, like, I've been, I got a lot of people recently from um, San Diego area, like, a lot, a lot, of interviewees in the last couple of days and some of it was like 40 which I think is probably like the frozen tundra for you I mean that's okay for us <laughs> but for you guys that must be like really cold it is definitely you know we have to wear a jacket you know that's like the big thing but um as long as you but have no a I jacket. tell you <laughs> yes I do well I have to I mean I I was never into the cold even like Chicago is legit like the coldest ever. I mean, I would like hide between buildings when I was downtown just to avoid like the wind factor. It it's was really just windy. Brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. We don't so. have as much wind here, but I also don't live in the sticks. So we live, I live in Milwaukee proper. And so we have some buildings, but we don't have them high enough to do like the Chicago wind tunnel. So <laughs> oh it's, it's, not it's a cool. real thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it was major. Yeah. I'm not a big fan. So, um, so I'm sure it's cold though. So I, I won't feel bad about it, but, um, so I really think what you're doing is interesting. And I love talking to fellow moms who are trying to sort of integrate their life, right. Integrate your work. And, um, you have some two young boys, so your boy mom, which is a, its own fun, you know, extra interesting qualities. So could you just tell everybody a little bit about like what you're doing right now and, and who you're serving? Sure. I think it helps to kind of understand where I come from too. So I was just going to give a little background because there is some irony in how this story uh, plays. Um, so I'm originally from Chicago. I used to work in corporate marketing and advertising for big brands like McDonald's and Burger King and all the big food guys. So it doesn't, the irony doesn't escape me that now I've done kind of a 180 and I'm really into promoting family wellness prevention. Um, and that was basically through my own experience. So having done the corporate thing, having worked on how to position products and even services that, you know, cater to healthy living, even though there, that was a big loophole or gray area of how you position certain things as health. I can understand culturally how we've been sort of misled or misinformed on what is even what is healthy. There's so much contradictory information. And it wasn't until I became a mom for the first time um, almost, uh, six years ago, which is kind of crazy. This is about as long as I've had a sabbatical on the corporate side of things. So, um, it wasn't until I was like feeding another little human and figuring out, oh my God, like what is in all of the products that I'm feeding my child that I started to actually care. And so I think that for me was like the big aha moment where I started to realize, wow, motherhood is like the first time that I actually even noticed the type of ingredients and the quality of ingredients that I was using to fuel myself, even though historically I believed that I was healthy and that I was doing all the right things. Um, And so that for me was like sort of led me down this sort of wellness path. And, And so I've really been able to parlay 
just understanding how we position um, products and services as healthy and how to use it for good. So now I am, um, I've started my own practice called Calibrate Your Wellness. That name itself was intentional just because I do believe that wellness exists within all of us. We just have been misinformed, right? And so I'm trying to break it down for parents and I'm on a mission to really help um, young families establish healthy habits right from the start because this is when it begins. And I've, I basically am like the living case study of how to really make this um, work. And it really starts with a parent. So that was a really empowering moment for me as a mom to really realize like I'm in control, no one else is in control, and then you can really model the right behavior for your children. So, yeah, I think um, yeah. Uh, for me, I, I, so I grew up really poor and so we didn't actually ever have enough to eat. And then when I got older, I wasn't thinking of quality at all, right? I had started out more worried about quantity, uh, but for me, it was the same. My first child, I have four small humans um, and my first child I had at 28 and I decided to nurse, which was not a really popular decision for a um, traveling corporate working mom um and and it was then when i was like trying to like get enough milk and realizing for my baby i had to drink so much more water i was like wow this is almost like the craziest thing but it was because i was drinking like so much under what i should have been um even a friend of mine who was nursing at the same time as indian and her milk smelled like the spices and i was like Oh, right. Like what's going in's coming out, like li literally. And uh, it was a, it was a eye opening for us too. We like, we made baby food with the first kid or like cloth diapers. We tried very hard. The fourth kid didn't go that way, but um, even like the food tasted weird, like, cause we would just like make peas, but not peas from a can because like there was stuff in that. Right. So you make regular peas and you're like, what does this taste so different? Because there's no salt in it. There's no preservatives. There's nothing in it. And I, I remember being kind of surprised. Like, well, what are we eating? <laughs> like, like, what are we eating? And then you don't actually want to know, though. Sometimes, sometimes when you look. No. Like, Ignorance is bliss in this sense. I will say that once you understand the correlation between um, how food is fuel for your body, uh, you become very um, protective of what you put in your body. And I use, I always use this like really, I'm a boy mama, as you mentioned. So I use a car analogy because cars are everything right now. Like I never knew so much about vehicles <laughs> or how many dinosaurs. models. Oh You're yeah. Dinosaurs are big too, but cars right now is like everything. So I like to say that, you know, you wouldn't put cheap gas in like a Ferrari or like a really nice car you would never dream of it. You would actually protect that and, you know, because the engine would break down. Well, same as your body. Why would you feed it things that just don't serve it properly? Right. And so it's just activating that awareness level for people to really start to connect the dots um, into like really finding what works for them. Right. So I just yeah. wonder, like we even learned about food differently when, so I actually went to the health coach Institute, which is I know you, um, I looked up your stuff, your integrated Institute of integrated nutrition. Um, they're totally different. You guys do a lot more in-depth nutrition study, but when, um, I started learning about food, like even the level of macronutrients, micronutrients, those types of things, I realized that I, I wasn't really taught. I like, we had health class, we had science class, but we we're taught about things that were more, I want to say more political. Like I live in the dairy state and everyone had like milk was huge, right? You had to drink lots of milk and lots of cheese and, and uh, like make sure you get everything in the pyramid. And no one ever really talked about the fuel, like that it was for you and that it was part of you. Like you put it in you and it became part of who you are. Instead, it was sort of like, you know, make sure you hit your you know, mark on the pyramid and no one really ever told you why. And then when you're a parent, like how do you, you can't educate your kids on something you don't know about, right? That you don't have so a good true. foundational knowledge on. So I feel bad for some like new moms 
gosh, it's already so freaky. There's so much you have to do and learn. And then all of a sudden you realize like, oh wait, I'm like feeding this little person like from me, like even what I eat now begins to matter so much more. Um, I made some changes. I don't think I made enough, uh, but it was definitely eye-opening um, how weird everything tasted. We have a ice, we had an Icelandic au pair. She freaked out when she came. She's like, why do you put sugar in everything? And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, your milk tastes like crap. She's like, what do you <laughs> dump like a pile of sugar? And I'm like, no, we just go to the store and buy the milk. And she's like, it's sweet. And she said the same thing about the bread. And I was like, bread? So I started looking. I'm like, oh my gosh, we actually put sugar in the bread. I would never would have thought about it. I just thought it was like grains that were cooked, right? So <laughs> we don't even real. we're doing things even other countries aren't doing. And we have been for so long that we don't even realize that milk isn't sweet, like that sweet. Right. Well, no, it was very controversial in my, uh, with my pediatrician. That's another light bulb moment too. I think that a lot of new parents realize that their pediatricians don't even, I mean, technically most medical doctors, I shouldn't say all, don't receive much nutritional information. Actually only nine hours of their medical schooling is dedicated to nutrition. Now, I know they're making huge strides to make that change. I know in Europe, they're even add, adding like a culinary feature to the medical school process so that they, so doctors actually learn how to, I don't know, use the kitchen, how to cook and understand how ingredients really are part of a medicinal um, protocol for, for certain patients or even a, as a prevention matter for people. So I think that um, when I started telling my pediatrician, hey, you know, we don't drink milk. So I've never, um, for the most part, I've always been pretty lactose free because I just never did well with it. Um, and so we decided that my kids would not have milk as well. And that was kind of a big like hoopla with my pediatrician at the time. Cause he was like, well, is he having any other dairy sources? Like he was really, really concerned. And I said, no, I, I don't, I don't believe that he needs to have, you know, milk as his part of his nutrition. And so that was like a big, you know, moment where I realized, wow, like, how is it that my pediatrician doesn't understand that there is a, a broad scope of, of how to raise your child that's not going to be um, sort of catastrophic to their development or, you know, try to instill fear or um, almost like dismiss your own motherly intuition. Like, no, I, don't, I know that, that my child doesn't really require that. I don't require that. I, you know, and so things like that. I felt like a lot of disconnection between the healthcare system and supporting motherhood, you know, supporting this new process of this new identity uh, of raising your child. So um, it's one of the reasons I try to do a lot of um, education on the forefront with um, birthing centers and working with doulas specifically, because I feel like um, any parent that goes to any of those particular outlets for birthing, I think is more open-minded to an alternative approach mm -hmm. to raising your child more holistically. So we do a lot of prenatal nutrition and even understanding that like, even before you conceive how important it is that your system, your microbiome is at a certain state that when you conceive your child and how that actually has a long lasting impact on uh, the development of, of your child and, and sort of the markers. So there's a lot of prevention that could happen even at, like you were saying, the school level, understanding it from the beginning uh, would really, help alleviate the learning curve, right? Of, of making habit changes. So. <clears throat> I think that's um, is another interesting, so that we had the opposite happen with our pediatrician. Thankfully, he's literally an amazing man. Um, <laughs> everyone loves him. But um, so in the dairy state, like actually it's funny, California, you guys think you are too, but you know, but <laughs> they, um, I was, I'm lactose, I was born lactose and like badly where they tried like goat's milk and all this, and I couldn't, like, I wasn't growing. It was really, really, really bad. Um, after getting pregnant, though, my body stopped being lactose intolerant, which I was like, what the holy heaven? But I think your body does whatever it thinks it needs to do. But the pediatrician was worried that our kids are getting too much milk. 
because we thought, well, we're not, and we're like, we're doing good things. We're not giving them juice. We're not giving, we give them water and we give them milk. And he's like, how many glasses of milk are you giving them? We're like, like four cups. He's like, a day? Like big cups or little cups, you know? And I thought, but I thought that we were, like, I thought we were supposed to do that. I thought that was like the right thing to do. Um, and then one of my four children is on the autism spectrum. And so when someone has like a diagnosis that maybe a lot of ha opinions exist on prevention or helping, um, food becomes, when people run out of options, they start looking at like regular stuff, right? When they're mm -hmm. like, there's no magic pill. Maybe we should look <laughs> at food. Um, there was a lot of things about like, you know, should she go cation free? Should she be gluten free? Just, you know, my oldest daughter all by herself, like she's meat free. She just doesn't, it just doesn't agree with her. Um, but I, I think there's something interesting about, like, I think everyone has different, a different foundation of what food is and how to, how to actually use it. It, it's not just a recreational activity, but <laughs> that there's like a reason for it. No, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, bio, yeah, bio individuality is a real thing. And that's one of the reasons why I encourage, you know, um, basically a lot of my programs is really empowerment. It's teaching them tools that, you know, I, I always jokingly say, like, I do not want clients to be with me forever. I genuinely want them to, you know, have the foundation and then fly away and be able to adapt to any environment that they're in because our bodies change through the years, through different stages in life. And to be able to have your compass, your internal compass of what is the right things for you, or to even recognize your body's natural feedback, right? And cravings and, you know, things like that, or changes in your palate, those are strong indications. That's your body's way of saying, hey, you know, this is not agreeing with me, or, you know, perhaps like making small changes will help you feel better. And there's so much, um, as you may know as well, like nutrition is just one aspect of your health and wellness. It's, there are like 12, you know, areas, if you will, that make up your well being. And, um, but you start with nutrition first because that's the first one that's like the center, right? That's what creates that foundation for you to be able to understand your energy levels, you know, other markers of your life that will help you support being more vibrant and having more, more energy. Because I think, Again, just like we've been misinformed with edu you know, nutrition, um, we also attribute age <laughs> or um, even motherhood of lacking energy or being tired all the time or feeling lethargic or all of these things that we, um, we just get accustomed to because we believe it's a life stage or it's associated to our age even. And you know, I've never felt stronger being almost 40 this year than I did 10 years ago at 30. Um, and it really had to do with just understanding, like tuning in, you know, to yourself. And that's another like beautiful practice that we can teach our little ones is understanding that correlation, right? So that they can yeah. be better judges for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, um, I completely agree with that. Um, kind of just paying attention to yourself because our body really does know. And I, I was literally having a conversation yesterday with a client about um, how many things do you tolerate because it's not acute. It's just the dull ache, right? But the dull ache is like your body nicely telling you that things hurt and you should probably make a change. It's the acute where we run to the doctor, right? Because our like the bone is protruding out of our leg. But for eight months, you know, your whole thigh hurt. And I think sometimes we have to slow down so we can even have an awareness that something isn't settling right or doesn't feel right or that food, maybe the best food in the world, green beans, right? Good for you, great food. And you personally have a body, bad body reaction to green beans. Well, you don't know that if you're munching on the car and running down the street and going down. <laughs> it's just hard to, to tune in to your, the signals you're being given. Um, but I think for me, that has been really important to try to help with the kids to just think, well, I don't like that. I don't feel good from eating that good. Like then we should like, don't eat that. Kids probably <laughs> not good for you.
<laughs> or, or even to be silly, like when they pass gas or something, you know, like yeah. these types of things or, or belching or anything like that, or um, those are just small little cues. And I know one thing that helped as a family when I was starting my health journey, I would have a little notebook and I would track and, you know, and it wasn't as meticulous as like writing down quantities or macros and all that nonsense. It was just being mindful of the ingredients and like the time of day and then just like how I felt, you know, um, and, and just keeping track of that because what's really tricky about the health process is that our minds are so powerful <laughs> and we can convince ourselves and we can talk ourselves out of things or into things. And we truly believe, Oh, I'm being healthy or I didn't have that much things or I, I eat healthy all the time. I don't know what's going on. And when you actually hold yourself accountable by physically um, becoming aware of the patterns, then you can start to be like, okay, now you can make informed changes that will actually lead to results. Um, and so I created like a daily tracker template on my, um, so that's a freebie that I wanted to make sure your listeners can take some practical advice from this conversation is to, um, I have a link, uh, basically I have like a resource link, which we could probably include in the show notes um, sure. that they can download for 10 days. It's just a one sheeter, super basic. Again, it's just making those connections of what ingredients make up your meals throughout the day. Um, and then also what um, digestive reactions you have. And so there's a whole way for you to track, um, you know, bowel movements and other barometers for digestion as well as mood that's a big one, right? Like if you feel like lethargic or a lot of anxiety or, you know, uneasiness that has, there's a lot of connections between certain ingredients that can cause that, you know? Yeah. So I think we're sensitive to that with our, with our daughter, just because we know like radical mood changes can come with a particular food and we're thought, and she's also gets hangry. She like really gets hangry. At, um, <laughs> And she's a hobbit. She eats like third breakfast, but then like yep. doesn't eat a lot during the rest of the day, <laughs> which is like, okay, uh, but a lot of fun. So I, I really appreciate all of this great information um, at www.calibrateyourwellness.com. There was like tons of other resources there as well. You have like a nice little link tree of um, different, uh, the freebies and different ways to contact you. But you know, what would a perfect, like a really ideal client or ideal person that you could help that you're like, yes, please call me. I want to help you, empower you to be your best self. What would that look like for you? I am really passionate about helping young parents, or even if you are in, um, you're expecting a baby. So I've had a lot of prenatal clients, um, and I just love the energy that is with young motherhood. Right? You're so they're so there's so much hope, and you're just so um, amenable to change because your body is physically changing that I encourage anyone, even if you are expecting um, or you're even trying to conceive too, fertility is another issue that I know you and I could probably talk so much about all the stages, but um, that has become such a big um, area of the work that I've been focusing on as well because I do believe that you know our bodies are represent you know, what we're able to carry forward. And a lot of it can be, you know, just if we address our lifestyle, barometer, you know, markers and our nutrition, it could set us up for success in even conceiving. Um, so I know that that's sort of a, a near and dear topic to my heart, because I know there's just a lot of moms out there that are wanting to be moms or wanting to have a second child and things that maybe have changed. And so I like to really empower that. So I didn't really, I don't know if I answered the question, but I really welcome young parents, expecting moms. Um, and ideally, if your children are under seven, that is a really nice, sweet spot. Um, the last sort of nugget of wisdom that I want your listeners to get, because this was also really illuminating, um, was about brain development and how um, between the ages of zero to seven in a child's life, uh, they are basically, and it's a, you're, you're programming your child in their subconscious mind. And basically what that means is that 95% of our actions live in the subconscious mind, meaning you think you're actually choosing what you're doing, but you're actually kind of an autopilot. And so our children, when they're under seven years old, that's, they absorb everything, all the words that they hear, the, you know, the environment in which they're in, 
it's literally like a little recorder, right? They're little mirrors, they reflect back what they see, they absorb, and they actually take it as their belief. And that's a really powerful thing because if you can just nurture their self-love for themselves and for, you know, like accepting themselves, understanding themselves, tuning into who they are, imagine if you had that foundation as an adult, that is, you know, that would avoid a lot of therapy. Yeah, (laughs) That's what we spend like the 30 years after that trying to get back to, right? (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. And that's why they say like, you know, you have these midlife crises is because you're actually, there's, there's only so much you can suppress throughout your life that at a certain point you have to come to terms with things that happen in our childhood. Um, and again, it's, it doesn't always lead to trauma, but what, it, what, what it, it's important to know is that perhaps a comment that you heard when you were little, you had this sort of, you know, inner self talk, you know, like the, the inner critic. I know for me, that was a huge one. And it wasn't until I started to realize, oh, you know, the connections with my childhood. So again, it's all about fine tuning from within. It really does start there. And basically, if I could help parents who are raising young ones to change that conversation internally for themselves, for, as for the little ones, then I think we can actually impact the new generation of really mindful, intentional uh, young people, right? So kind of get us out of the mess we're in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. So um yeah. we'll make sure in the show notes we'll have um the, the URL to get there, some of the freebies that you mentioned. And of course you can help anyone, but it sounds like you <laughs> really feel inspired and empowered to work with people who have little ones or are hoping for little ones or are cooking a little one. Um mm-hmm. that sounds like uh and those are they're all so cute. Now I'm so past the baby stage. I'm at the like, oh, you have a baby. I'd love to hold it. You can have it back now. Yeah, I'm there now. I hear you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, poor, no, no, I'm good. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, I know I appreciate you taking time out. I know you have a really busy practice and busy mom with your little guys, but it was really nice meeting you. And hopefully you can stay in touch and give us updates so our listeners know what you've got going on for any programs or anything that launches in the future. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.